want to show you the landscape tonight. And here we are. Happy Good Friday to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening to you. Blessed Good Friday and, and blessed Monday, Thursday, yesterday. We didn't meet yesterday because, well, various and sundry reasons, but here we are today. So, blessed Good Friday to you. We're reading a little bit further in our William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Act four, and we'll do scene one today, which is Friar Lawrence's cell. And it's a bit of a substantial scene. So I'd like to read that with you to, together today, this evening, and then when we get the chance to meet next, we can compile scene two and three together because they kind of, you know, same business going on. But I do want to start in here in act four, scene one. Recall that up to now, I have been leading the witness with the ideas that uh, this play is not a romance, that it's rather it's about the ideas of nominalism and realism, that it is also about the idea of ungoverned or unbridled lust in action, and that the destructive force of that lust in action has ramifications that um, are here and in the afterlife as well. So, we'll pick up today to read a crucial scene. We just read a fantastic scene about Juliet with her parents, and she grew angry with them for trying to help her out. And we'll read a crucial scene today that exposes a little bit more, I think, about the character of Friar Lawrence. So hopefully you have your book with you, or a text online, and you have some sort of uh, malefaction with you to be able to uh, conquer the, the vitals. And let's read together first, and then we'll do a little bit of discussion afterwards. Shall we? Act 4, Scene 1, Friar Lawrence's Cell. Enter Friar Lawrence and Paris. Friar Lawrence begins. On Thursday, sir, the time is very short. Paris responds. My father Capulet will have it so, and I am nothing slow to slack his haste. You say you do not know the lady's mind. Uneven is the course. I like it not. Immoderately she weeps for Tybalt's death, and therefore have I little talked of love. For Venus smiles not in a house of tears. Now, sir, her father counts it dangerous, That she doth give her sorrow so much sway, And in his wisdom hastes our marriage, To stop the inundation of her tears, Which, too much minded by herself alone, May be put from her by society. Now do you know the reason of this haste? I would I knew not why it should be slowed. Look, sir, here comes the lady toward my cell. Enter Juliet. Ah, happily met my lady and my wife. She responds. That may be, sir, when I may be a wife. That may be, must be love on Thursday next. What must be, shall be. That's a certain text. Come you to make confession to this father? To answer that I should confess to you. Do not deny to him that you love me. I will confess to you that I love him. So will you, I am sure, that you love me? If I do so, it will be of more price being spoke behind your back than to your face. Poor soul, thy face is much abused by tears. 
The tears have got small victory by that, for it was bad enough before their spite. Thou wrongest it more than tears with that respect, report. That is no slander, sir, which is a truth, and what I spake, I spake it to my face. Thy face is mine, <laughs> and thou hast slandered it. It may be so, for it is not mine own. Are you at leisure, Holy Father, now, or shall I come to you at evening Mass? My leisure serves me, pensive daughter, now. My lord, we must entreat the time alone. Oh, God shield, I should disturb devotion. Uh, Juliet, on Thursday early will I rouse ye. Till then, adieu. Keep this holy kiss. Oh, shut the door, and when thou hast done so, come weep with me, past hope, past cure, past help. Ah, Juliet, I already know thy grief. It strains me past the compass of my wits. I hear thou must, and nothing may prorogue it. On Thursday next be married to this county. Tell me not, friar, that thou hearest of this, unless thou tell me how I may prevent it. If in thy wisdom thou canst give no help, do thou but call my resolution wise, and with this knife I'll help it presently. God, join my heart in Romeo's. Thou are hands, and ere this hand be by thee to Romeo's sealed shall be the label to another deed of my true heart with treacherous revolt turned to another. This shall slay them both. Therefore, out of thy long experience time, give me some present counsel. Oh, behold, twixt my extremes and me, this bloody knife shall play the umpire, arbitrating that which the commission of thy years and art could to no issue of true honor bring. Be not so long to speak. I long to die, if what thou speakest Speak not of remedy. Hold, daughter, I do spy a kind of hope, which craves as desperate an execution as that is desperate which we would prevent. If, rather than, to marry County Paris, thou hast the strength of will to slay thyself, then is it likely thou wilt undertake a thing like death to chide away this shame, that copest with death himself to escape from it? And if thou darest, I'll give thee remedy. Oh, bid me leap, rather than marry Paris from off the battlements of yonder tower, or walk in thievish waves, or bid me lurk where serpents are, chain me with roaring bears, or shut me nightly in a charnel house, or, or are covered quite with dead men's rattling bones, with reeky shanks and yellow chapless skulls, or bid me go into a new-made grave and hide me with a dead man in his shroud. Things that to hear them told have made me tremble. And I will do it without fear or doubt to live an unstained wife to my sweet love. Hold then. Go home, be merry, give consent to marry Paris. Wednesday is tomorrow, tomorrow night, look that thou lie alone. Let not thy nurse lie with thee in thy chamber. Take thou this vial, being then in bed, and this distilled liquor drink thou of. When presently through all thy veins shall run a cold and drowsy humor, for no pulse shall keep his native progress, but surcease. No warmth, no breath, shall testify thou livest. The roses in thy lips and cheeks shall fade to paley ashes. Thy eyes' windows fall like death when he shuts up the day of life. Each part deprived 
of supple government shall, stiff and cold and stark, appear like death. And in this borrowed likeness of shrunk death thou shalt continue two and forty hours, and then awake, as from a pleasant sleep. And when the bridegroom in the morning comes to rouse thee from thy bed, there art thou dead. Then, as the manner of our country is in thy best robes uncovered on the bier, thou shalt be borne to that same ancient vault where all the kindred of the Capulets lie. Uh, in the meantime, against thou shalt awake, shall Romeo, by my letters, know our drift. And thither shall he come, and he and I will watch thy waking, and that very night shall Romeo bear thee hence to Mantua, <laughs> and this shall free thee from this present shame. If no inconstant toy nor womanish fear abate thy valour in the acting it, give me, give me, oh, tell not me of fear, Hold, get you gone, be strong and prosperous in this resolve. I'll send a friar with speed to Mantua, with my letters to thy lord. Oh, love, give me strength, and strength shall help afford. Farewell, dear father, farewell. Exeunt. Well, so that ends the first part of Act 4. And a couple things to say on this. Um, I know there are some that want to argue that um, Friar Lawrence is a good man or that he's trying to help the situation here. But I think of all the things that he could have said, all the things that he could have done in this instance, to tell Juliet or Romeo to slow down, to counsel them against this hot-headed action that they engage in, to try and get them through the difficulty of being separated from one another, anything to avert them from the disaster that's looming ahead of them. He doesn't do any of those things. I mean, there is a point where he says to Romeo, slow down for they stumble who run fast. But it doesn't really have much traction, and he doesn't go further than that to try and slow them down at all. Remember that I had pointed out earlier that Friar Lawrence, from all that can be deciphered here, was based upon two characters from history, a Paracelsus and a, a, a Roger Bacon, both of whom lived in the 13th century. And there was a recent book written about Roger Bacon, even right before Shakespeare's time, that Shakespeare might have had access to. So he was basing his character on those two men. And like all of Shakespeare's great characters, both his heroes and his villains, I think that Lawrence is a complex character. One can't pin him down and just say he's bad or that it's all his fault. But I do tend to think that Lawrence is very much at fault for what happens next in this play. It's quite a disaster. I'll point that out if you've never read the play or seen the movies. It's quite a disaster. But I think Lawrence is very much at fault. Even if he isn't a bad man, I think he's at fault. And why? Because I think that Lawrence is an embodiment of this alchemical attempt to fix the world, to change things for the better, to bring together these two contrary positions of nominalism and realism, or male and female, or... Capulet and Montague, or whatever we want to say. I think that his attempt to do so through this elixir of life, this aqua vitae that he has, this, um, this potion that he gives to Juliet, I think his attempt to do so is very symbolic of something that would come later in history. And in this vein, I think Shakespeare is very prophetic. You know, a student once asked me, what, what is the nature of a prophet, of any prophet? Even the Old Testament prophets, I suppose one could say. 
The nature, I think, of a prophet is somebody who sees how the world is trending, sees how people are trending, and understands human nature, and says, if you do this, this will result. And the prophet, in that vein, has access to the, the, the word of God, to the mind of God. But he has access in the sense that he foretells what might come on the on the horizon, what's coming towards us on the horizon. And in this case, I think Shakespeare was very prophetic because I think what was coming on the horizon for Europe and for Western culture in general was this big shift in the imagination called the Enlightenment. You know, Shakespeare lived at the end of the 1500s, beginning of the 1600s, and it was a time period when the Renaissance had pretty much run its course and was beginning to not slow down, but change. Not as much optimism, not as much um, potential uh, seen for good, and a beginning skepticism, a beginning distaste for where history was trending. And you see that even in the 1600s amid certain thinkers um, who write uh, in history, like Descartes, for instance, who talks about um, how he can only, he can only know that he exists because he's being deceived, right? And because he has something there to think about, he knows that he exists. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Or later, uh, Thomas Hobbes, who writes about how life in the state of nature is, solita is na solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That's in the Leviathan that he writes about and how we have to have government in order to keep ourselves from destroying each other or eating one another. And you had those men during the 1600s who were thinking, this has gone, t this has gone wrong, this, uh, this experiment has gone wrong, and all this, this uh, deception about religion and deception about high and noble ideals has gone wrong. We have to do something different. And I think the thing that they thought had to be done differently was to begin to see the world as a machine because that's what the enlightenment really is it's seeing the world as a machine you know to divest ourselves of all these superstitious attitudes as they were condemned to be by the french thinkers superstitious attitudes about things like a soul or about heaven or hell or god or jesus or about honor or beauty or or joy that all those things are basically part of the machine and in the enlightenment the attempt was to understand the machine in order to be able to control the machine and improve the machine and i mean i like all of us we have all been compromised in this because we have taken the coin of Caesar, so to speak. We, all of us, live within this idea that the, the world is a machine. You know, we are warm during the winter and cool during the summer. We have full bellies. We have a monetary system that doesn't seem to collapse. We drive our vehicles and fly our machines in the air. We communicate via a vast network of cables. All these inventions are part of the enlightenment vision of the world. They would never have existed, or they might have taken a longer time to exist, had people not begun to think about the world as a machine that needs to be controlled, dominated, and improved upon. So we all of us owe a great deal to the men who thought in this vein, in the enlightenment. And that thinking of the Enlightenment thinkers is essentially, it's a, it is a form of alchemy. It is trying to conquer the worst parts of this world and improve on them. Even the worst parts of this world, sickness and death. I mean, I thank God for our modern medical system, without which many of us would not survive very long. But for some folks, the ultimate goal of medicine and technology and uh, improvements in society is to conquer even death. 
and to live forever, to gain eternal life by technology. I mean, there are some who have said that if they can plant their consciousness in computers, they will live forever. The hope is that that would occur. And that's an alchemical attempt. It's an attempt to, um, to use the elixir of life in order to prolong our own lives and to cheat death. I think that that might not be what we are put on this earth to do. And Shakespeare seems to be prophetic in this, in his character Friar Lawrence, who does attempt to cheat death. I mean, yes, he does seem to want to help Juliet. But it seems to me that Friar Lawrence is one of these characters that never lets a good crisis go to waste. He uses the crisis of Romeo and Juliet in order to try and prove that his elixir will work. And he almost succeeds, <laughs> as we shall see. But it's not for, um, it's not for a goodness or virtue in, in him that any of this goes well. And I'm struck by some of the lines in here, in this scene, because they do seem to smack not just of haste, but of a lack of a belief that there is a providential system or that there is a providential God. Remember that providence and vision of the world as providence is set against a worldview that the world is random or that the world is simply a machine and that it's blank on the other end, it's darkness on the other end. These are two opposing viewpoints. And we can lump to some degree, we can lump the idea that it's all random. We can lump it together with the idea that there is nothingness or there's bleakness or that there's um, just a machine. They're very similar, um, very similar attitudes towards the world. And there are several lines in here that I think kind of contribute to that vision. Notice that when Juliet, for instance, she greets Paris, first off, very coldly, I must say, and uh, almost rudely, you could, you could make the case that she's rude to him, who hasn't done her any wrong and doesn't mean her any harm. But then when she has the chance to, after Paris leaves, she says to him, right, that if he doesn't give her good news, she will kill herself. She will stab herself with this knife. I'll help it presently, instantly. I'll help my resolution, right? Because I'll kill myself. And then she turns around and says, God, join my heart and Romeo's. And ere this hand by thee to Romeo's sealed shall be the label to another deed, or my true heart with treacherous revolt turned to another. This shall slay them both. Which is, a, it's odd because God joined us together. And if we're going to be separated, I'm going to kill myself. Which is against the law of God. And I'm going to impetuously do this and suddenly do this. And then later on, she says, I long to die. I long for death. And then she has this marvelous speech afterwards when Friar Lawrence says, I do spy a kind of hope. There's a slim chance that we can fix this, right? And she says, bid me do these various things, to leap from a tower, to walk in thievish ways, to lurk where serpents are, or, ch or chain me with roaring beasts, bears, um, or put me into a, a, a world of a charnel house, right, with dead men's rattling bones and reeky shanks and skulls. Right? Cast me into a, a new-made grave and hide me with a dead man in a shroud. The worst things, and I'll do them if it'll fix this. So it's almost like Juliet herself longs to engage in something that's macabre and, and dark and brooding. It reminds me a great deal of the scene out of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, written in 1818, that Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein, does work with bodies that is, it's inhuman. It seems grotesque and, and, and um, macabre, to say the least. Here she has a similar thing, right? Cast me into these almost appalling situations, if that's what will fix things. 
And then Friar Lawrence says, no, 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 no. We'll have a false death. I have the potion to be able to, to put you into a false death and thus to cheat death because you'll wake up from this false death. You'll wake up. And if that's the case, then when you wake up, Romeo will be there and you guys can go to Mantua and all will be well. It'll be fine. You won't ever have to actually face death. And in his little plan, I think, is where we see the real error, in, in my opinion, that Lawrence makes. Because she's eager to accept the plan. And she has the strength of will to do so. Because she's a very strong-willed, as we saw before, very strong-willed, very intelligent woman. Young girl, but woman. But Friar Lawrence's plan is a plan to cheat death, to escape from the, the grip of death and all the consequences of one's actions. Which seems, on the one hand, to be a really great solution, right? If we could cheat death, if we could live forever, if we could put our, our consciousness into computers and, and just continue on in perpetuity, wouldn't that be the, the ideal situation? Wouldn't that be ideal to never have to suffer or to never endure pain or loss or, or anything and just live forever? I was reminded today on Good Friday of two great poetic works, which I may have to read at some point. One of them is the work of T.S. Eliot, The Wasteland. And the wasteland begins, if I can remember it off the top of my head, April is the cruelest month. And then the other one is the book of Ecclesiastes. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, the prophet says, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. You're going in, you're going out. The sun rises and the sun sets, and whither goeth man? And all rivers run to the sea. Now I have to read those two poems, I think, at length, but the idea in both those poems is that here is this vision of the world of running about, trying to get this object or that object, trying to fix this or fix that, trying to cheat death. And what's the point? It's all vanity. It's all vanity. There's a phrase in Latin, memento moris, or mortis. Remember death. Keep it in mind. We all suffer it. And the strength to be able to hold on, even knowing that we're going to die, is a strength that, that shows courage and heroism and true humanity. I forget who said that, it may have been Fulton Sheen, that Christ's suffering is, is man alive, right? At our greatest moment of suffering is when we are most alive, truly human. And we see that even in our modern situation. In our current situation of facing this, this virus, it brings out character in a person. I met with a fellow the other day who was terrified, terrified of dying. He was my age, terrified of dying, terrified he was going to get sick and pass from this world. Why? That terror is the mind killer, right? Fear is the mind killer. And why do I go on about all this? Why am I ranting about all this? I think because Shakespeare was being prophetic about exactly what was going to happen in the next four or five hundred years. With the attempt of the Enlightenment to cheat death, I think we entered into a Faustian bargain. By that I mean we gained something good and we lost something good. 
what we gained in the enlightenment and we are now living in the midst of it is the luxury and the pleasures and the joy of comfort and we gained this ability to think we can live forever and not have to think about old age physical misery or death everything can be fixed by doctors and scientists a pill and what have we lost what have we lost in all that I think we have lost to a great degree the tenacity to be able to hang on despite everything I think in some ways we have lost over the years as a culture as a society the strength to be able to face what is inevitable the strength to be able to accept defeat and know that it's not the last word on this Good Friday to think about that that love has the strength to be able to conquer all things love has the strength to be able to hold on even in the midst of sorrow and awfulness and failure and if we don't have that vision which is providential by the way that's the providential vision then our failures are the worst things ever and our physical failures are the worst things ever and our own life's failure meaning death is the worst thing ever and so I think as a culture we have gained comfort and have lost to a great degree the courage to be able to face death we are fearful men we are hollow men men without chests as T.S. Eliot says elsewhere now that I think is a tragedy but I think it's something which Shakespeare was already for, foretelling. He was thinking about that already in the 1600s, the early 1600s, in his characters. That as people like Romeo and Juliet gain this ability to cheat death, they also gain fear. They also become fearful people because they lose that tenacity. I have not yet shared the counter to the two sonnets that I have been talking about up till now, and I think it would be good to do so this evening. Sonnet 129 and 147, I think, are embodied in this poem, in this play. And those two sonnets talk about how unbridled lust, getting everything that you want, wanting to dominate the world, which is what lust is in the old definition. And which, by the way, is what one branch of the alchemists want to do, dominate the world. The desire to dominate the world ends up making a person bloody-minded, not to be trusted, uh, fearful, um, all those different adjectives, right? Is there a counter poem to that, a contrary poem to that? I think there is. I think Shakespeare wrote one of the greatest poems about what love actually looks like when he wrote Sonnet 116. And I think in Sonnet 116 we see not only this counter to the, the type of, of desire or lust we see in Romeo and Juliet, which is destructive, and a counter to the attempt by Friar Lawrence to conquer death, which, as I said, is a Faustian bargain, is a Faustian deal. I think we see a counter to that. And even some of the words that we see in Sonnet 116 are used in this play, which may be coincidence, but I don't, I don't think coincidence in Shakespeare uh, are, they don't happen very much. Shakespeare seems very intentional in a great many things that he does. So here's Sonnet 116, and I'll finish with this, right? Sonnet 116. Listen in this sonnet and see if you can't hear some of the same images and same phrases that we see in the contrary uh, form in Romeo and Juliet. 
Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love that alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh, no. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth is unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. That's a great sonnet. I noticed that in that sonnet, Shakespeare seems to indicate that real love, contrary to lust from sonnet 129 and 147, real love is patient and slow and endures great agony and suffering and loss. And it bears things out even to the crack of doom, even to the, the very end of, of, of time to see things through. It's not fearful. Would that we lived in a time where we had those luxuries that we do enjoy and were not such fearful people. But I will say this, that if one can adopt that providential vision, belief, not belief, it comes over time. But if you can adopt that providential vision and make that effort to slow down and to begin to see the hand of the divine in all things, you stand a much better chance of not being rash and not hasty, my aunt friends, and not being self-destructive or bloody-minded and not ending up like Romeo and Juliet. You have a much better chance then of seeing the beauty of this life and to not be afraid when this life ends and you have to go on to something else. It was Socrates himself who said that there are only three possibilities, right? When you die, either you go to nothing, in which case you want to be great because you won't know the difference. Or, when you die, there's a long sleep, which is nice because sleep is good. And after such a turbulent world, it'd be nice to sleep. Or third, when you die, there's either a reward or a punishment based on how you've lived your life. And if you've lived your life well and nobly and tried to be virtuous and do the best you can, what should you hope for? Right? but joy and happiness eternal. Spem in alium, as the, as the piece goes. And I think about that greatly at this time of the Triduum here on Good Friday as we wait in grateful hope, anticipating that Sunday rising again when all tears will be wiped away, when all sorrow and misery and terror will be swept away and the sun will rise. And I think Shakespeare really held to that vision as well, despite all of his cynical moments. Sorry if it's a bit preachy, but it seems like Shakespeare merits it, being a prophet as he is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is getting dark, and it's time for me to go inside, so I will say adieu to you until we meet next time, which will probably be next week. Uh, have a joyful, blessed Easter. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Go with God. <laughs>